Hello and welcome everybody to another episode, another week with Bearski Film. Tonight we're joined by a really cool guest, Brad from Unbearable Sports. Uh, if you guys have not checked out his YouTube channel, definitely check it out. He's got a lot of great content. And uh, how are you doing tonight, Brad? You know, I'm I'm hanging in there like the rest of us Bears fans, right? So it's 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 un- unfortunate, but yeah, we'll we'll get it out, talk some sports, talk some Bears. But yeah, thankful to be on this show. So thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. And man, it's it's just a week filled with such high emotion and it it's amazing how quickly this thing has gone so sour and it's just it's all over the place. And I mean, I I was kind of going through it and it's just at every level there is fault. Starting with Caleb Williams missing some easy throws, just being inaccurate when the opportunities for easy plays are there, which haven't been a lot, but sometimes they do try and do something for him to help him out a little bit. He has not executed. And so then you look at Shane Waldron, not making it easy enough, consistently enough to groom a rookie quarterback and, and just not putting together a good game plan, not having any kind of rhythm in play calling or anything. And then you look at Matt Eberflus, who had Luke Getzey here for two years and went out and decided to get Shane Waldron. And ultimately, it falls on him as the head coach for all those things. And then you look at Ryan Poles for sitting there during the offseason and not even interviewing another head coach as if there's no better option out there than Matt Eberflus. And then, although I don't like to go here much, you know, then you look at ownership and you go, okay, and we're also too cheap to fire this guy because we'd have to pay him while we still pay another coach. And so it's just remarkable how at every step of the way there's there's bad issues and the stories that are coming out too about the whole like four years or five years for matt eberflus i think that's something that's like five years you give to a proven head coach and it sounds like from based on the stories from like brad biggs adam rank they're saying that flus might actually have five years rather than the typical four which maybe it's because they knew that they were going to be blowing things up year one but still doesn't make much sense. And like, to your point, Paul, you're, you're a billion dollar organization, what 5 billion or whatever it is, you can afford that, right? Like that's the big thing. That's frustrating. You're a billion dollar org. You, you got to make the right moves and you have to keep on moving on. And also too, they need a new pro scouting department because Shane Waldron why, why didn't we know more about like his actual personality before hiring him? Same thing with like a Nate Davis, simple pro development, pro scouting that we just didn't do with some of these people. Brad, I actually texted David the other day and I said, do you know what Mike Rabel said when they got rid of Nate Davis? <laughs> yeah. We want guys that practice. Yep. There was your evaluation right there. I don't know, David. No, I mean, I I agree with all your guys' points and I can get into more details on how I personally feel and stuff. But yeah, the facts are the facts. Um, Ironically enough, if if I'm not dead on on this, I know it's in there, like top three, top four per person in terms of staff members. The Chicago Bears have one of the largest front office staffs in the NFL. So I don't know the exact number or anything like that, but I remember listening to an anecdotal podcast comment from... Um, two of the guys that I really like and like to listen to and respect Hogan Johns. And they were talking about how walking through Hallis Hall is like, it's awkward. It's almost weird how many staff members you pass just like walking back on a day-to-day basis. They have, you know, a person for cleats and a person for the shoe that goes on the cleats. And then the, the, the laces, like a third person to lace the cleats. And then it, it's just kind of this. So everything is ass backwards. And then um, one for, to manage all three, right? <laughs> and then there's a guy to, to inspect the cleats after they've been laced by the first three guys, you know? And then so part of that, I think, goes into all the things that just piss me off today uh, tremendously. I'm, 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 I'm ebbing and flowing between apathy and pure rage. And um, if you know anything about me as a sports fan, like I'm ready to know. I'm ready. If it wasn't for this YouTube channel, I probably wouldn't watch a single game the rest of the year. Um, I do feel like part of my fandom now has been attached to uh, this investment of time and my my love for us doing this on a week to week basis. But I've boycotted Chicago Bulls basketball for 
five, seven years. Uh, I've boycotted the bears for two to three years at a time. Um, I still know what's going on in the background, but I'm dangerously close. And uh, part of that that makes me mad about what Brad brought up is, you know, for a billion dollar organization to have such a staff, right. To hire so many people and, but to still penny pinch when it comes down to, it's not like you're doing this all the time. It's not like you're firing coaches left and right. David Tepper is paying for, and if I'm not wrong, I'm close. It's three or four head coaches simultaneously, especially if he uh, goes into this year or uh, the Raiders right now are paying for three coaches simultaneously at the same time. So as much as those organizations aren't necessarily something to model yourself after, at least they're trying, at least they're doing something. And it's not like the bears are the bears are one of the teams in history. Never, ever done it before. It's not like you're doing this hand over fist and wasting millions of dollars. Do it one time and maybe it'll work out. You can't keep saying this won't work or make you better if you don't even try. And that's part of why I'm just so angry today. Well, you mentioned like good organizations. And one thing I always like to do on my show is kind of bring it back to like the real world, like us regular people that have to work normal jobs and stuff like that, where when you think about like some of the best leaders that you might have worked with and or higher ups and other things like that, they usually ask, well, there's one guy that comes to mind that kept on saying he's like, what is the problem we're trying to solve here? And like would keep asking that because as a leader, you're supposed to understand the big picture. You're not supposed to get involved with like emotions and stuff like that. But what's the big picture? And Paul, you kind of mentioned a little bit on this too, where Caleb hasn't been doing well. Well, also the wide receivers haven't been getting open, right? And the offensive line, the play calling, the defense can't stop anybody running the football. There's like six different problems. But also when you have something like that, then it goes into, well, what might be causing some of this and what might be the first problem we have to solve? And right now it's the morale. It's people giving up on this team, not wanting to be there. And if you have a problem with people not wanting to show up for work, Nate Davis and other things like that, to me, it boils down to the coaching staff. And I'm not a fan of firing the coaches left and right and other things like that. But this is a scenario where it makes a lot of sense, especially when you have Brown, who could easily step into an offensive coordinator spot because he's done it before at Carolina. You also have Washington, who's already your defensive coordinator, and also Hightower. During the offseason, he was a, a what head coach for the Shrine Bowl and has aspirations. Like when I was listening to, you mentioned Hogue. Hogue interviewed him and was talking about like, yeah, I'd, I'd like to be a head coach someday. You have the interim pieces there, and it seems like everybody is frustrated at Flus, like giving up on Flus and giving up on um, our offensive coordinator. So why not? Why not try and change the morale and try to get people to actually believe in this team? And, you know, and there's a there's a root cause to that. I mean, we all know it. It's four major collapses. I mean, you have four games where you had a 95 percent chance or higher to win in the fourth quarter. And time after time again, you failed, you failed, you failed and you failed. And I, I take it back to last year, I believe after. The second one, because the first one was, I believe, the Broncos. The second one was um, the Lions. After that one, I was like, I'd be done. As a player, I'd be done. And, and credit to them, they weren't. They still kept going. But then, you know, you, you you had that terrible game, I believe, against the Browns where it came down to a Hail Mary that you didn't get, right? Or you came a yard short. Like, you, you've had all these just terrible, terrible losses and collapses and here we go again this year and it roars its ugly head back in and this year all it took was one all it took was that washington game for these guys to just be like that's it well like brad said and then the the morale because paulie you and I, you and i literally right after washington i we called each other and i'm like man i i can't fathom how you as a player can come back the next week and keep playing hard and stuff like that. And the only reason I wasn't brave enough to make that statement like on the shows or publicly, or just kind of saying it more with uh, like chest out was because I said, I've, I've said this four times before I've said this every time, every time they did this. And I was like, I can't fathom being a fan and seeing this and doing this or being a player and seeing this and coming out the next week and playing hard for this coach. And, yeah, I, this had to be the one that broke the camel's back. And I was saying it's a poly for Arizona. Like, there's no way. There's no way. It can't happen again. They can't come out again. And But 
I haven't been proven right yet. I, I be, I've been proven wrong every time. This one had to be the straw that broke the camel's back. It After a while, it adds up. And part of it was, I think, going back to our collective thought on this is we said that you know, while your players are young and while they're being molded and while they'll believe anything, you can get away with this rah-rah bullshit and you can kind of blame the kids for it because that's what college coaches do, right? They blame the kids and they know best. And that's why these guys come into the NFL, these college coaches, and they, they fail catastrophically because they can't point fingers anymore. They have to like, they have to self-own and self-scout a little bit and do stuff like that. And when Matt Eberflus got hired, you know, we were talking about the hits principle and how it's a cute little gimmick and stuff like that. But these guys became pros over the last two, three years while Matt Eberflus was still staying in the same place. So you hired this guy who was a decent coach to get you through the hard times who can mold some young players. And then now these are professionals and they know what they're doing. They've been doing it for three, four years since you've been here. And they don't buy your bullshit anymore. You got Jaquan Brisker coming out on Twitter today. I forget the exact thing he tweeted, but something along the lines of, if you if you keep trying the same shit, you're going to get the same result or something along those lines. Like, And so that's what you're having right now. you got these pros who are fed up. And like Brad said, with morale, I think that's the only – because you're naming these areas, right? Offensive line, quarterback. What's the mm-hmm. one thing you can do to kind of trickle in a little bit of sauce into all those areas? As a manager, you can you can improve the the joy, the morale. You can't fix each problem individually. Dave, the rookie QB is fed up. Yeah. Not even the pros. The rookie quarterback is well, fed up. That's because he's he's probably ahead of his schedule, right? Like he is a mature person who's eye rolling already at Shane Waldron nine games in, going like, dude, you don't know what the fuck well, you're talking because about. Because three games in, he was running to the sideline chewing him off for not getting the plane fast enough. Right? Yeah. Like it, like you you know, Brad, just to I'm gonna let you respond here in a second, just to give you a little bit of background. David and I know each other through work. I used to be his manager. He used to be an employee under me. And I was, I'm was i totally, totally fine with um, with being what's it, Michael Scott from The Office. You guys yeah. want to just have fun and let this thing ride? <laughs> sure. But it's, it's really, truly your employees that kind of sometimes set the expectation for you of, hey, are we taking this serious or, or are we not? Like, is you know what I mean? And then from a point of management, in my opinion, it's important to listen and kind of respond in that manner. And so, like, you know, seeing Caleb do that, it's like, okay. But then, you know, at the same time, these guys have been in football their whole lives. And and you so talk they about, like, should be setting the expectations high. Like, it should be set. And, like, what Dave said, like, they're professionals. And it's, like, kind of that whole manager aspect. Like, the whole new wave of management is, like, empathy and, like, being like, yeah, you know what? I got it wrong. And I think about like Mike McDaniel, the Miami coach, you hear all of his mic'd up moments where he's like, yeah, sorry about that too, a bad play. And, and just kind of moves on. And it's that the thing that I said that I got a little bit of flack, um, a couple of people didn't like it that I said this, I disagreed with the Tyreek Stevenson benching, not saying he shouldn't have been disciplined, but why I, why I disagreed was because the coaching staff did not take accountability for blatant mistakes that they made and the the players knew that the players understood but when you discipline a player but you don't discipline yourself while everybody there your your employees your players are not stupid they know that you effed up and the fact that they did not take accountability then what was the first thing that Matt Eberflus said at like after they got whooped in for the Cardinals he's like ah this is all the coaching staff and you know it's BS because after this game, when he was asked about that, they're like, "So what would you change?" Uh, just like everything, e- everything could be better. And then you ask it's, Caleb Williams, and he's like, "I could do this. I could do this." So it's just BS, and it's like people can smell BS a mile away. And I think that's where everyone's given up. Where it's you're not going to take accountability, so why should we? So it's it's one of my least favorite societal kind of things going on right now. Is is being so dead set or hardcore on your opinion and then hard over correcting when you're proven wrong instead of finding nuance or middle ground. And so that's what this is, right? Is like Matt Eberflus was just always in this hard, hard this direction and well, the players need to execute better and we need to look at the tape the next day. It's like, dude, do you not know what you saw yet? Like you need a day or two to process. 
And then it's like, well, now it's like, you know what we, yeah, it's all on me. Blame me first, blame me. First. And it's just this hard, hard overcorrection that just, like you said, it's just so disingenuous and just not believable. And, uh, and it's just, it's, it's disgusting to watch. And that's why part of it is you can't, we can't even watch it. And imagine going to work and listening to someone try to motivate you and talk you into working harder now because you're Michael doing Scott. bad. <laughs> yeah. And Michael Scott trying to tell you to work harder. Yeah. It's, it's so, wild. So Brad, that's where you're completely right. And like, so although I was all for the Tyreek Stevenson benching, I also have a philosophy on how I would like my football team to be ran. So I get exactly what you're saying because you've established three years of a certain way of doing things. And so you benching Tyree Stevenson doesn't necessarily fit into that mold of what you've been doing. So I understand that. I prefer, even though this guy didn't have much success in the NFL, I prefer what Mike Singletary did. Went out right after the game and called on Vernon Davis. Can't win with him. Mm -hmm. Can't win. But, but he had established that he's a no bullshit kind of guy. And so what you're going to get from him is no bullshit. And like, you know, to, to not be able to process things in the moment, to need a day or two or three to reflect on it is damning to me i mean that is just that's terrible and you know i i, I my father-in-law always likes to bring this up to me he says he saw a, a video with bill belichick talking about him and brady's relationship and be like i'd see three to four different things on any given play brady would run to the sideline and name me seven or eight different things so don't act like you can't learn from the player as the coach like there's clear communication there and there's also respect for the talent and and you know what i mean and then there's just a conversation a decision and execution and it just seems like that is a mile away from what the bears have going on and and that's where it's like the players need to get better right caleb has to perform better everybody has to perform better but it's the same thing when the, since the coaches aren't taking accountability and you're fed up and you're giving up on the coaches. And then if someone comes in and be like, hey, yeah, uh, if you could just be better at your job, that'd be great. Right. Like we'll they save my job and then we're all happy. <laughs> and then, you know, like and that's where I think that kind of comes in. We were kind of alluding to this. And that's part of uh, one of my questions. And I guess I'm just, I'll just kind of segue into it. Part of that problem and the whole reviewing tape for two days and this and that. One of my biggest things that I. I upset me today was when uh, I texted Paul, I think around 10 saying like, Hey, no one's been fired and I don't expect anybody to be fired. Paul pointed out the whole Dave Kaplan little mini fiasco that was there, which you can't convince me wasn't on purpose and totally staged. And it was literally him just going like, but I'm, the in paper to the phone. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm losing you. I'm losing you. I'm losing you in a tunnel. Oh, and so that's what that was. The bees, right? The bees. The bees are coming. <laughs> and then um, the other part of it is the fact that you needed an extra hour and a half. You delayed your press conference an hour and a half, your typical Monday press conference. And that's what you fucking trot out. That bullshit is what you needed the extra hour and a half. Forget the day. Forget the overnight part. That I can kind of fathom. Yeah, cool. Guess what? Sorry. Um, you're having a bad fucking time. I know you want to go home after we after work on Sunday. You're coming into the office. If you're Ryan Poles, if you're George McCaskey, if you're Kevin Warren, if you're anybody who fucking matters, and you're saying, Matt, drive your ass back to Hallis Hall, and we're meeting right now, and it's six o'clock, and you're gonna miss dinner. We'll order takeout. And we're going to talk this out so that tomorrow morning we have a plan in place because, and like how you guys kind of gave the, the parallels to work. And, you know, I always, certain times with my wife, like she knows football, she listens to us, but I'll kind of try to lay it out in a way of her job where I'm like, Hey, you got to do this press release or something. And your current boss is a moron and he's going, you know, you know, I might be gone by Wednesday. I might not. So keep working on this press release the way I like it to be done. And then we'll see what happens Wednesday. And then Thursday, a new boss comes in and goes like, scrap that. It's due Saturday. Let's do it again. Stop wasting those three days. Why are we wasting Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday? This should have been immediate. This should have been concrete. It should have happened last night. The decision should have been made. What did you possibly gain in the extra couple hours this morning? It's literally just a bunch of dorks going like, let's sleep on it and see how we feel tomorrow. 
because it makes no sense. The choice should be obvious. So to delay a, what did you gain from an hour and a half delaying of a press conference? You are wasting so much time preparing for the Packers, which let's be honest, I'll take my life savings and bet it on the Packers right now. They're coming off a bye week too. And yeah. that's exactly my point is you're wasting precious, precious hours that you don't have to prepare for the Packers, which George is going to be upset. Virginia is going to pooper, pooper, pooper diaper. Like she's going to shit her diaper when she sees what the Packers do to the bears this Sunday. Cause that, you know, nothing upsets Virginia like a Packers beating, you know, cause that's really where our priorities are. While the Packers have been preparing for your dog shit performance for two weeks. They're probably done. They've been done four days ago. They, we don't need to see anymore. We don't need to study any harder, but they will be because that's a good franchise. And that was one of the most of all the micro and the macro of everything today. The, the extra hour and a half as if you need it to figure. And then you still don't have an answer. Well, David, Shane, he was on fired, but he's not fired, but he won't call plays, but he might call plays. He was on the phone with T-Mobile trying to figure out his phone connection. Didn't you hear the Kaplan yeah. interview in the morning? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he had to do oh, that. Wow. He was busy, you know. He probably did that to Ryan Poles. He saw the, the call from Ryan Poles and was like, I can't hear. <laughs> he gets home, he's like, shit, I got a job for 24 more hours. <laughs> he's like, I'll just do the interview. I'll I'll, I'll make something up. I'll say it's uh, my decision to figure out what happens with Waldron, right? Yeah, I'll say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Brad, you know, one of the things that I was talking to with David was, in my opinion, when it comes to head coaching impact, I think the most impactful times coming from the head coach position come when the team is either really bad or really good. And this all stemmed from somebody in a chat that I was participating in. I was watching some podcasts. Somebody's like, well, you can't count the first year. You can't count that three and 14 season the first year. And I go, well, in that case, like I, I looked at um, Ryan Pace and I was like, Kevin White, okay, I'll give you a pass. But then after mistake, after mistake, after mistake, after mistake, after mistake, guess what? Kevin White now enters that conversation as the first mistake. So, like, to me, your job as a head coach, it, it, like the impact you have is to be able to elevate a shitty roster and have it overperform based off the lack of talent. And when your talent finally gets good enough and your team's a playoff-worthy team, to take them over the top. But like this whole middle bullshit, a lot of coaches can do. You, you're relying on the talent, and the talent can get you in the middle no problem. But you, you have shown to me from day one that you're not able to elevate poor talent. And so, like, people kept saying, hey, Iberflus, this good defensive guy. What was he before Montez Sweat? What was he after Montez Sweat gets hurt? All of a sudden, this defense just doesn't look as good. Well, maybe it's because of Montez Sweat and the defensive line pressure that's actually creating opportunities for these guys. Don't act like you can't get another coach in here to get some production. The and parallel also, right now, sorry, Brad, to just kind yeah. of give you even a, a more accurate parallel. The parallel of what the year that Paulie's saying is wasted and doesn't count, the Broncos are doing it as we speak. There you go. They have $60, $70 million in dead cap space with a rookie quarterback and a completely under-talented roster in the AFC West where the Chargers are beasts, where the Chiefs are beasts, and they're yep. six and three, Competing. six and four, whatever it is, five and four, yeah, and Brad, they're what do you think? over 500 team. Well, it's, it's the whole idea of, like you said, coaching, elevating the players that they have. And like... I actually think that Eberflus on the defense because we had Alan Williams before everything was terrible and then things started getting better. And I heard um, a non bears podcast kind of talk about this where they're like the bears defense should not be this good still this year. But then all of a sudden everything started coming apart. And that's where too, like when you talk about the same old, same old, we've already seen this. Like if, if Shane Waldron is going to be the goat, like the, the scapegoat that they throw everything on, we saw this, what, six months ago, seven months ago when, when we got rid of Luke Getze and that was the only, like the offense was the only thing that we did. So are we going to do that whole thing, that whole song and dance again? And that's where it, yeah, you just need to try something different. Cause to the point of like, people know that this is not going to end well. And if you just get rid of one of the managers, but the, the director, the person in charge that's still calling the shots is still there people are going to be like okay what is this then so you're just going to get rid of them this is just the same exact stuff that's going over and over and over again 
and no one's really going to want to play. And you have to do something for Caleb Williams. You really have to do something for him just so that this isn't a complete loss and he's just frustrated and he doesn't want to be here.